Welcome back. In this third and final part of our discussion of the securities markets, I'm going to talk about various secondary market trades. So I'll briefly mention some terms and definitions that I didn't cover in the previous video. Then I'll cover margin trading, short sales, and international stock trading. So let's start with some definitions for bull and bear markets. A bull market is a market where prices are rising and investors are relatively optimistic about future growth opportunities. In other words, investor sentiment is high. The period from 2011 to 2019 was generally considered a bull market. A bear market is the exact opposite. This is a market where asset prices are falling and investors are pessimistic about growth in the value of assets. Next, we have a long purchase. And a long purchase involves someone buying a security or taking the long position on that security in the hopes that that asset will appreciate in value. Uh, the objective here is what we usually think of with a trade. Buy low, sell high. Someone who takes the short position believes the value of the asset will decline in the future. A short sale occurs when an investor wants to profit from the decline in the value of an asset. And so their goal is to sell high at first and then buy low. Uh, I'll walk you through short sales in a more detailed discussion in a bit. All right. Now, regardless of whether you're taking a long or short position, we always need to know the hours when stocks are trading. In regular trading sessions for U.S. exchanges, the market is open from 9.30 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. However, most exchanges and alternative trading systems offer extended hours. For example, the NASDAQ pre-market period is from 4 p.m. to 9.30 a.m., and after-hours trading occurs from 4 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, the problem with pre-market and after-hours trading is that in order for your trade to be processed, your order needs to be a limit order and it must match another outstanding limit order. Uh, we call a market like this a, a crossing market. And pre-market and after-hours trading see relatively low trading volume when compared to regular trading hours. In other words, there's a lot less liquidity. Now let's talk about buying on margin. Now, Margin is a callable loan provided by a broker. You can borrow up to a certain limit in order to buy more securities. You pay your broker an interest rate plus a service fee. The interest rate your broker charges is generally relatively low. The loan is secured by the assets in your brokerage account. When we're going forward, I'll refer to margin as the percentage of capital contributed by the investor. In other words, it's your own personal equity in your brokerage account. It's what you have left when you pay back your broker. The initial minimum amount of margin you can have in your brokerage account is set by the Federal Reserve at 50%. However, over time, your minimum margin, also known as your maintenance margin, can be lowered. If the amount of margin you have in your account falls below the maintenance margin, you'll suffer a margin call. Now, this means that your broker will require you to add more cash to your account to increase your margin above the maintenance margin, or your broker is going to start to sell the assets of your portfolio for you in order to repay your loan to them and increase your margin. All right, so this is the formula we often use to calculate margin. You can use it to solve any or practically any problem related to margin. So, like I said, our margin is just the percentage of our market value of our portfolio represented by our own equity. Uh, what we can do to calculate that is multiply all the shares of all the stocks in our portfolio by the price of each stock, subtract the amount we borrowed from our broker, and the div then divide that by essentially the market value of our portfolio. All right, let's take a look at a very basic example of calculating the maintenance margin. So let's say the market value of my account is currently $10,000 and I have a maintenance margin of 40%. What that means is that $4,000 of my $10,000 brokerage account is my own money, my equity, and $6,000 is the uh, broker's amount. It's, it's essentially the margin loan that I received from my broker. Uh, so if my maintenance margin is 40%, my capital always has to be at least 40% of the total market value of all the securities in my portfolio. If, uh, let's say, the value of my portfolio falls from $10,000 down to $9,000, I'm still going to owe my broker $6,000. But this means that I'll only have $3,000 in equity. And so 
my margin will fall below the maintenance margin. And I'm going to either have to add more capital to my account, or I'm going to have to start to close my existing positions. Now, there's one reason why you would want to buy on margin. You want a higher return. Buying on margin amplifies your return because you only owe what you borrow plus some interest to your broker, while any capital gains on your portfolio net of that borrowing are yours. Obviously, the big disadvantage of buying on margin is that you've increased the amount that you can lose, uh, both because you owe what you owe to your broker and also because you're paying the interest rate on the loan for your broker. All right, let's take a look at buying on margin in an example. You have $1,000 in a trading account and you want to buy as much as you can of Apple stock trading at $100. Your maintenance margin is 50%. How many shares can you buy on margin? Well, here's our standard maintenance margin. It's just the equity in our account divided by the total value of our account. So it's really just equity divided by equity plus debt or equity divided by total assets. Uh, so if our maintenance margin is 50% and we have $1,000 in a trading account, how many shares can we buy on margin? Well, total assets would be 2,000 here because this would be the total assets that would get us to our maintenance margin. And we can essentially back this out. We know that $2,000 in total assets and $1,000 in equity, well, what that means is that $1,000 must be debt. So all we have to do is just take our $1,000 of debt, plug that in to our basic maintenance margin equation, and then uh, we know that the share price is $100, so we plug in $100 times shares owned minus 1,000 divided by 100 times shares owned, and we can solve for the number of shares owned. Okay, let's take a look at one more example of buying on margin. If the price of Apple stock from the previous question falls from $100 to $90 after you buy the stock, how much will you have to add to your account? Because obviously your margin has to be equal to or greater than the maintenance margin. Well, let's see what our maintenance margin or what our actual margin is after the share price falls from $100 to $90. So we have 90 times 20 shares, so we have $1,800 in our total account. Subtract out the margin loan, divide by our $1,800. So our current margin right now is 0.444 repeating. Uh, that is lower than our 50% maintenance margin, which means we're going to have to do something. We're going to have to add capital or adjust our positions so that we get back to at least 50% margin. Uh, so what we can do is we can solve for the cash added. So we just add in you know, our cash. Uh, so let's say we solve for cash added. This will give us a, you know, you know we take 1800 over to the uh, other side. That'll get us 900. And then we uh, take these and subtract our, you know, 1800 minus 1000. That's going to give us 800. And so 900 minus 800 gives us a cash added of $100. So in other words, in order to get back to the maintenance margin, we're going to have to add $100. All right, so let me try one more example here, just because maintenance margin, it is a, an important topic. If you decide to take the CFA exams, this is a topic you will absolutely see. Uh, but you know, if you're trading, you should absolutely know how margin works. So one more example is not going to hurt. All right, so you just purchased 100 shares of Tesla for 200 each, and your initial margin is 50%. The maintenance margin is 30%. How far can the share price of Tesla fall before, before you receive a margin call? So we'll start off and determine how much cash and debt we've used. All right, so our total assets are just the $200 shares, and we own 100 shares. So our total assets are $20,000. And we know our margin is 50%. And so we can solve for our equity and our debt position. Well, we know right away, you know, 50% margin, that's going to mean 50% of 20000 or $10,000. Uh, but really all we need to do is just, you know, solve this equation. We take 20000 over to the left-hand side, 20000 times 0.5 gives us equity position of 10000 And then the remainder is our debt or our margin loan. All right, now let's solve for the price per share. So we get back to our original margin formula, which is just the total value of all shares, you know, just price times number of shares owned, minus our margin loan amount, and then divided by essentially our, our total 
assets, our price times number of shares owned. Uh, so we know that our margin is, our maintenance margin is 30%. And we know from the last uh, few seconds that we've borrowed $10,000. And we know that we have 100 shares. So all we have to do is solve for the price. And, you know, we take price times 100, take it over the other side. So we have 30 times price. And then we just have 100 price uh, minus 10,000. So realistically, we have 10,000 on the left-hand side is equal to, well, 70 times price. So we solve for price. We get $142.86 uh, QED. Okay, now let's talk about how we calculate the return on a margin account. So this is actually the formula for calculating the return on a margin account. Basically, what we do is we take uh, the total current income received minus the amount that we're paying on or we have paid on the margin loan uh, because you'll always be paying interest on a margin loan. And then we have the market value of the securities at the end of the period or at sale minus the market value of securities at purchase. And then we divide by the equity you have at purchase, the equity, not the total value of the assets. So let's take, say we have a very quick example. We've received $100 in dividends, and we've had to pay $125 in uh, interest on our margin loan. But at the sale point, or when we sell, we are selling our, sh our shares for $7,500. And our initial value of those shares when we bought them on margin was $5,000. But we had a 50% maintenance mar or uh, initial margin, so our initial equity was 2,500. When we solve for this, we get 2,475 or 2,500 or 0.99 or 99%. So in other words, uh, a difference or a change in the value of our assets from 5,000 to 7,500 nets us a 99% return. Why? Well, because we levered up. We bought on margin. And, you know, the amount we owe is staying relatively the same if you don't count the interest. But essentially, we, when we lever up, we're just we're increasing the return on our, our $2,500 of initial equity. OK, so that's it with respect to margin. Let's talk about short sales. Uh, a short sale is a trade you make when you believe the share price of an asset will decline. Your profit is equal to the market value of the stock at the beginning of the trade, minus the value of the stock when you close out the short trade, minus any dividends the stock paid during the shorting period. Most short trades are actually for a very uh, small amount of time, usually a few months at most. Uh, you short a security when you believe it's overvalued and the value of that asset is going to fall. So let's take a look at how this actually happens. So there's really two days that we care about with respect to a short trade. It's day one is the day you short it, and day two is the day that you close out your position. So on day one, what you're going to do, let's say you're down here, you're going to borrow shares from your broker and then immediately sell them on the open market for cash. All right, so where are those shares com coming from? Well, either your broker is going to have those shares and be willing to lend them to you, or they might have another client whose shares they can lend out. So regardless of where those shares come from, you're borrowing those shares essentially from your broker and selling them for cash. And you get cash and you can do whatever you want with that cash until you close out your short position. Now, on day two or the, the closing period of this trade, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to buy the same number of shares of that stock on the open market and you're going to return those shares to your broker and thus close out the short trade. So your broker is going to receive those shares. Or, and if they borrow those from another of their clients, you know, the client is you know going to receive those shares. But basically, this is a lot simpler than I'm making it. You basically tell your broker you want to short and then immediately you're shorting those shares for cash. And then at some later point, you buy shares and tell your broker when you buy those shares that those are to close out the short trade. Now, like I said, our shorting profit is basically the difference between what you uh, shorted those shares for and what you bought them back for, plus any dividends, plus any interest to your broker. Because during the time when you're shorting, uh, you are getting a, you're 
you know, essentially shorting on margin. So you're paying your broker some small interest uh, percentage. So your profit is essentially uh, starting market value of that short position minus all of this. And if you want to calculate a return, uh, you just divide that by the margin requirement. Uh, so let's take a look at an example. So you believe that the price of Ford stock, currently $10 a share, will fall, and you want to profit from that decline by shorting $500, 500 shares of Ford stock uh, for a year. Your required maintenance margin, or margin percentage, is 75%. Your broker charges 5% to brokers. Ford also paid a $0.25 cent dividend, and the share price falls to $8 a share by the end of the year. Uh, what is your total profit and return on this investment? Well, the market value initially, when you short those shares for $10 a share at 500 shares, is $5,000. The market value when you buy those shares back well, the current price per share at that point in time is $8, and you're buying those 500 shares back, so $4,000 is MV1. The dividends that uh, were received on those shares are the $0.25 cent dividend times 500 shares, so $125. And, you know, essentially our margin requirement is market value initially bought, multiplied by our margin, our required margin, so $37.50. And our interest is essentially just our margin requirement uh, uh, multiplied by our interest rate. In other words, that 37.50 times, we'll say 5% interest rate gives us 187.50. So our shorting profit, which is the thing that I'd say is way more interesting here, is, well, just the $5,000 we shorted for minus the 4000 that we closed out for plus the dividends plus the uh, interest which gives us a shorting profit of 675.50. If we want to calculate the return, all we're doing is just dividing that 675, uh, I'm sorry, I said 675, uh, I meant to say 687.50. Uh, you're just dividing that by your margin requirement. So in this case, it's just 687.50 divided by our initial margin of 37.50, which gives us 18.33 or an 18% return. So not bad. All right, now let's move on to our final topic in this section, international markets. I've spent a lot of time describing the U.S. market, but there's a lot of other large markets where securities are traded. The largest financial centers outside the U.S. are London, Tokyo, Shanghai, Hong Kong. Each of these cities has at least one large stock exchange. London has the LSE, the London Stock Exchange. Uh, Tokyo has the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Uh, most of the large exchanges operate in a manner similar to that of the NASDAQ, with electronic trades comprising either the majority or the entirety of the trading volume. Now, holding international securities is important for investors, primarily for the diversification benefit. International stocks are more exposed to markets that U.S. equities might not be exposed to. International stocks might also be denominated in different currencies, which, if they appreciate relative to the dollar during holding period, could be beneficial to you. Also, you might be able to find some significantly undervalued securities. So, uh, one question we should ask is, how do you purchase international securities? Well, there's several ways to do this. The safest method is to increase your exposure to international markets by buying shares of a U.S. multinational like Coca-Cola or Apple. Uh, these firms, like Coke, operate in well over 100 countries, and so they're exposed to market forces in each of them. Uh, so, you know, the benefit of holding an, uh, shares of a uh, stock like Coca-Cola is that if demand for soft drinks increases in, let's say, South Africa, Coca-Cola is going to benefit. You know, we're going to see increased profit due to that increased demand, and that's going to lead the firm to potentially, we'll say, increase its dividend. Another way to invest internationally is to simple, simply buy shares of stocks that trade on foreign stock exchanges. For example, if you identified a firm in Botswana uh, where shares are undervalued, you might be able to buy shares directly on the Botswana Stock Exchange. Different exchanges have different rules, though, uh, and so ultimately your broker will determine which exchanges you're allowed to buy and sell on. You may have to pick up another broker in order to invest on the Botswana Stock Exchange. Another method is to buy shares of international firms whose shares trade on U.S. stock exchanges. Uh, 
some firms from developing countries might not have a stock exchange in their home country, and therefore they could decide to list shares on the NYSE or the NASDAQ. Uh, these firms are often going to be the largest stocks in their respective markets. The final way I think you could certainly invest in international equity is to purchase ADSs or uh, American Depository Shares. And ADSs are shares that trade on U.S. stock exchanges, but are backed by shares of stock in another market. U.S. banks will typically buy up those shares that are trading on the international exchange and then hold those shares in, theoretically, in their vault. And what they're going to do is they're going to issue shares on the NYSE or the NASDAQ that are backed by those shares that are held in that vault. So, you know, this allows U.S. investors to buy and sell shares of international firms like Alibaba or Heineken. So those shares that are, you know, essentially trading on the NYSE, those are what we call ADRs or American Depository Receipts. And each ADR is backed by international shares that trade on an international market. So if you wanted to buy shares of Alibaba and Alibaba was trading on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, what you would do is you buy the ADR shares, just like you would any stock on this uh, NYSE, and then one share of Alibaba would correspond to a certain number of shares on, let's say, the, the Shanghai Stock Exchange. I can't remember which uh, exchange Alibaba trades on. All right, now, investing in foreign securities is often more risky than investing in U.S. securities. And this is because the same risks like credit risk, inter interest rate risk, business risk, they all apply, but international stocks can also face political risk and exchange rate risk. I guess they just face greater amounts of political risk and exchange rate risk than U.S. firms do. Now, political risk refers to the risk associated with changes in legislation, regulation, or anything to do with the rule of law in a country. Political risk in the U.S. has historically been fairly low since it's governed by a common law legal regime and has, fair, has relatively favorable shareholder rights, and it's historically assumed that the rule of law holds. In other words, everyone should be held equal under the law in the United States. Outside of the U.S., that's potentially less true. In countries like China, Iran, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, that's not the case. In these countries, individuals and businesses can have their assets seized without warning or without due process. A common political risk event in these developing world countries is called nationalization, where the government announces it's taking over the assets of some business. This happened in the 1950s in Iran, uh, when the assets of British petroleum were seized by the Mossadegh regime. Uh, Venezuela also nationalized its oil industry in 1976, taking control of oil wells and refineries. Uh, so there's a lot of things you have to be worried about when it comes to political risk. Uh, nationalization will typically happen in authoritarian countries, though. All right, the last risk I did want to mention is exchange risk or exchange rate risk. Uh, sometimes we call this currency exchange risk. Uh, this is the risk caused by the varying exchange rates between countries uh, that have two different currencies. And as you can imagine, if you buy a stock denominated in euros and then sell it six months later, the exchange rate between the euro and the dollar will likely have changed. And we need to factor this change in exchange rates into our return formula. So how do we do this? Well, we use the total return formula, you know, or I guess we could say the holding period return formula multiplied by the exchange rate at the end of the holding period Divi uh, divided by the exchange rate at the beginning of the holding period. So in other words, we're just using a holding pay period return and multiplying by the change in the exchange rate between the two currencies. All right, let's take a look at an example. So you buy 100 shares of Carrefour, which is a French grocery chain, kind of like Kroger, for 15 euros per share on January 2nd. The exchange rate on that day is 1.1 euros per dollar. Uh, so you paid essentially... Uh, 1.1 dollars times the 15 euros, so you're paying 16 or 1,650 dollars for these 100 shares. Uh, so what you're doing is you're taking your dollars, converting them into euros, and buying the 100 shares. On July 2nd, those shares are worth 20 euros per share, so you sell them. However, the exchange rate on July 2nd is now 0.8 euros per U.S. dollar, and so. When you sell those shares, 
uh, you're selling them for, well, yes, 20 euros instead of the 15 that you bought them for. But when you convert your euros back into dollars, you're converting it at a lower rate. In other words, each euro is now worth less per dollar. So each euro is buying uh, 0.8 dollars. So when you convert back to dollars, now you're getting $1,600. So ultimately your return was your initial payout of 1,650, uh, you know, subtracted from the amount that you cashed out for, or $1,600. So divide by the starting uh, value, 1650 your actual return was negative, even though the stock appreciated in value. Why? Well, exchange rates moved uh, not necessarily in your favor. So although Careforce shares appreciated, the depreciation in the value of the euro harmed your portfolio. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. So let's just summarize what we talked about here. Uh, buying on margin increases the risk and the potential return on any investment. We also talked about shorting, and shorting allows an investor to profit from the decline in the value of a stock. So if you believe the value of a uh, stock is going to decline in the next week or month or so, you would want to short that. And finally, we talked about international investments, and these investments increase your amount of political risk and exchange rate risk, and you need to take that into consideration when you're in investing internationally. So with that, I'm going to conclude, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.